Okay, thanks very much, John, and uh, thanks for uh, putting this on. This is a, been a really fun workshop so far. Looks like it'll end up that way um, when the conclusions are written. Um, normally, uh, I'm very much of the disposition that to have people interrupt me as I go um, to try to make sure that everything's clarified. But given the um, broad range of uh, backgrounds of the people at this workshop, I'd prefer that points of clarification about notation, or for example, as one typo, at least so far I've caught in an equation, things like that. If anybody um, sees those, if they want to ask, that's fine. But anything that's a bit more of a foundational concept, if they could hold that to the end, I want to instead give a flavor of the whole things. And there's, there's many, many um, things underneath the hood here that each of them would be expanded into an hour talk. So. Um, to try to avoid getting caught up in those, I'd like to just push through it. And this is work with uh, Josh Groschow, um at the Santa Fe Institute, a, a new postdoc there. Um, so what I'm going to start with, there is this whole body of work that goes back to Gillard, um, Brion, um, and then with um, Landauer, and especially 1961, and Bennett, uh, Maxwell's Demon, all these things, where people have been trying to, in essence, follow up on John Wheeler's idea of it from bit, focusing on the manifestation of that in the domain of thermodynamics, which is a very roundabout way of saying that people have been worrying for over a century about what thermodynamics and physical physics, how it relates to computation, information theory, and so on, at a very deep foundational limit. Um, what are the limits that laws of physics apply in information theory, and vice versa? One of the seminal contributions to this line of work <coughs> came from the 1961 paper by Rolf Landauer, and especially the following work by Charlie Bennett, Ed Fredkin, um, Toffoli, and so many and a lot of other people. It goes under the moniker of um, the heat of erasing a bit, or the thermodynamic entropy that needs to be um, shunted out to an external environment if you erase a bit. The notion is that if you look at any physics process that can be viewed as logically irreversible, which is what happens when you erase a bit, that doesn't matter how smart you are, how sophisticated, um, so long as, well, it's been actually now applied to quantum as well as um, uh, classical physics, modulo any kind of um, oddities in quantum gravity, it doesn't even matter what kind of physics you might use, you are going to pay a price of generating KT log to heat. That's why you need a fan at a fundamental level. People are actually, and some chips are getting up to the limit of this bound. Within a decade, they might all get there. We will still need fans of some sort to cool off your computer. You need them to cool off your head. This is where it starts to connect up with biological systems. The biosphere, in a certain sense, needs to actually radiate heat just because it is doing computation. This is how all these things are actually being brought together from a much more um, Another aspect of the azimuth vlog perspective, um, right now 5% of the carbon burn in the U.S. is due to computation. Google and so on, they have to put their big data servers right near things like the Columbia River to cool the beasts. A lot of that is not yet due to the Landauer limit, but ultimately it would be. So um, with that kind of a preamble, the Landauer bound, this KT log 2, it's actually, if you look at things, forget physics entirely. Just consider measure-preserving flows, which is what physics is, um, classical physics and quantum physics both, um, when you look in detail. So Liouville's theorem applies and so on. It's just a matter of shuffling around volumes in space. You don't even need a Hamiltonian function. Everything is just shuffling volumes. So here's an example. I've got myself a computer. It's got two states, okay? A bit. It can be in state V1 or V2. Um, the, these are the information bearing degrees of freedom. This puppy, which has those two states in it, one of its bits at least, it's got a whole bunch of non-information bearing degrees of freedom, as they're sometimes called, stuff under the hood that's in there in addition to the state of that bit. So, working in what's called the microcanonical ensemble, where you have measure-preserving flow, at the beginning of things, your bit can be, let's say, um, with uh, this probability given by the size of that white square, and that prob of uh, being in state V1, which could be, for example, 0, and with this probability being in state V2, you erase a bit because it is measure-preserving flow. I can't just take this and superimpose it on that. No can do. So you've got to do something like put it on top. <coughs> okay? So far, so good. At this point, 
Nothing has been um, done in terms of generating heat, but let's say that you want to now be reset your computer so you can then iterate and do something again in the next round. <coughs> that means you need to return to the state where your um, spread, in essence, in the non-information varying degrees of freedom, it has a um, size r. This is somewhat of a caricature. You can make all this much more general. That means you've got to take at least half, you've got to take half of this total area and get it out of your computer. Your fan does that. It maps you down to there. It's the fans needing to get this back to have that height R again, just like it started with, the resetting operation at the end of each cycle of your computer. That's what your fan needs to do. And that's it. That's how foundational this is. There was no Schrodinger's equation, no QCD, nothing underneath this. It's very, very general. <coughs> One thing that um, some aspects of this that are very crucial, this works only when you actually know the pre-erasure value of the bit. You, this computer would be useless if I did not know its state before I actually ran it. Who cares about a program where you don't know its initial state? There's a bunch of confusion in the literature where people actually use the word Landauer limit to refer to scenarios in which you actually do not know anything about the pre-erasure state. But it's important that you do know it. In fact, the prior probability distribution over the pre-erasure value, and in particular its entropy, is irrelevant. The entropy of the initial configuration of your computer before you run it does not have anything at all to do with the thermodynamic heat that's actually being generated. Entropy is going to be all through this, but not that entropy. Okay? It, it actually requires very careful um, engineering to make this property hold. In the lexicon, it's not micro-reversible. You violate local detailed balance which is another way of saying that this beast, there were a bunch of very smart people who put it together in a very careful way so that all of this would work because they wanted your computer to erase that bit no matter what its initial state was. That is different from a lot of things in the natural world like chemostats, ideal gases, and so on. A fascinating question that right now nobody knows, do biological systems obey local detailed balance? Are they like engineered systems? or like gases. You can actually ask that in a statistical physics fashion. And I don't think anybody's actually addressed that issue. Um, you can also run this in reverse. You can flip around what's your environment and what's your system, figure versus ground. You can, by introducing noise into your operation, a one to two map rather than a two to one map, your computer that's operating that noisy way, it's now a refrigerator rather than a heater. So, so to speak, if you want to Warm up your room. You're living in Boston in the middle of this past winter. Put a bunch of computers in it, like this one, where it's doing a bunch of two-to-one mappings and it's trying to be very accurate. If you now move to, say, Houston in the middle of July, you want to cool yourself, put a bunch of computers. They're actually very, very noisy. They're doing one-to-two maps. Now it's going to be cooling your room. And there are examples in physics, what's called adiabatic demagnetization. And people are actually starting to use this um, in the design of real computer chips, this phenomenon. And again, it's very interesting to wonder about whether this goes on in real biological systems. Okay, so let's say, so that was sort of what's been well established before in a certain sense, that's just reviewing um, very, very old work, um, 61, so that's um, well over 50 years by now, um, casting it in terms of just measure-preserving processes. Very, very simple, obvious questions have not actually been addressed before full stop, like, well, okay, I'm in the real world interested in things more than just a single bit at a time. Let's say my system has four states. And let's say that part of the conditional distribution of the future given the past is going to be um, collapsing, many to one. Part of it is going to be expanding, one to many. And there's also just going to be sort of a mixed entangle. What's the thermodynamic cost of that kind of a thing? This is very crucially important for biological systems because the question becomes, do, does biology, natural selection, is it going to actually try to choose a conditional distribution from a present value of, put in an n-tuple there, it doesn't have to be a four-tuple, to the next one, such that the thermodynamic cost is as small as possible? And I'll argue toward the end of this talk that the answer is yes. I should be ending about 10.30? Okay. So far, is there any... Just clarification points as opposed to more <laughs> foundational things? Okay. Silence is assent. You've all signed the form. 
Okay. You plug in for this uh, equation for this question of you've got an n tuple to an n tuple with an arbitrary conditional distribution taking present to future, um, like an arbitrary step in a non-time homogeneous Markov chain or something like that. You get this as the expected value, actually. This is expected thermodynamic cost. This is what you get for your um, expected cost. It's a let me just w sort of walk through it and point out some aspects of it that's very, very funky. This is actually a special case, but pi is your dynamic equation for next state. We're just doing discrete time here for simplicity given current state. This is your um, current distribution. We are off equilibrium. This is non-equilibrium statistical physics. That's your distribution over the starting state. So for example, that could be the starting state of your bit that you are about to be erased via this map pi. And there it's just over pi itself. Anybody who's played around with information theory or, or basically algebra enough is going to look at, the, or probability theory enough, is going to look at this and going to say it's very wacky because in here, that sum, there is no probability distribution that is hitting against. It's a very weird beast. There does appear to be some work in the information theory literature that um, involves this, though in a completely different context. It's unusual enough, it doesn't even have a name, but it does actually have some fascinating properties, which I'll get to in a second. But this is the answer, and I will just in one slide show that when you plug in, for example, that this pi is a two to one map, because V can take on two values, that independent of this, you're going to get a log two here, and the expected cost is gonna be log two. If you um, re-express things properly, it also turns out to be a difference of two mutual informations. Sorry, Question. Uh, log two and the oh yeah, well, that's one of the typos. Thank you, sir. Yep. Should have been a V prime right there. That's a V prime. Um, so I just was being um, anal retentive. I wanted this one to not get confused with that one. Um, so it's a very weird looking kind of a beast. Um, but also, as I say, um, W here is your unobserved degrees of freedom. That was back here, this axis. And so what this formula here is saying that, it's e that as the mutual information between your information bearing degrees of freedom and your ones you're not observing, um, your expected cost, if that in mutual information grows with time, then you've got to be shunting some heat outside. This can actually be written in other w very interesting ways in terms of callback library divergences and all kinds of stuff. It's, there's a lot that could be said just about this funky formula right here. Here's an example, the promised example. Let's go back to a two to one map. In a two to one map, your evolution distribution, it's if I'm, if I'm uh, going, taking bits, zero or one down to a zero, that means pi of zero given zero and pi of zero given one. Both of those are equal to one because I'm doing a two to one map. You put that in here, this is going to be a sum of, that sum is going to be going over this term plus that term, so it's just going to be two. So this is log two. Here, this V of t plus one, notice it doesn't even matter in there anymore. So this is just going to be normalization of probability, so your entire thing is just going to be log two. And you can do it for the one to two map and get the same kind of a thing. It's fun to, well, for some people, for nerds, it's fun to play around with a couple of uh, special case examples of this. <coughs> so the first obvious thing to do is to try to get bounds. If I give you a fix a pi, the uh, Markov kernel, and then say I can vary over all possible states of my computer, um, what are the p bounds on that expression for expected thermodynamic cost? Here's typo number two. This is the change in entropy over the information varying degrees of freedom. That's the expected cost. It is lower bounded by zero. So expected cost is always greater than the change in entropy. It's upper bounded by this funky looking beast, which you also won't actually see in um, information theory. Actually, I've never seen that one at all. So which of those two plus signs is this one? Uh, this is, let's see, that's a minus. Yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, Decrease, decrease, decrease. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, don't ask me to, f to figure out my, 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 my minus signs on the fly uh, in public. <laughs> what, one of them's wrong, yes, and I will figure it out um, a little bit later. And, and what's very funky about this is this thing appearing here. I can go into sort of the coding theory justification for this. That's basically saying that if I generate the um, present value that should be, yeah, yeah, if I generate the present value 
according to a uniform distribution and pop it through pi, that's going to induce some distribution over the future, and that's this. Here, instead, you're saying if I could, rather than just generate randomly what a state was at time vt, if I actually choose um, a single specific value, what is that value that gives me most information relative to what I would have had if I had started with this uniform distribution at vt? It is actually an alternative to information capacity. There are many kinds of scenarios where this arguably is more reasonable to use than information capacity, which was ultimately actually motivated in terms of the noisy channel coding theorem that John was alluding to before. That is a very good thing computationally because calculating what's called information capacity, that's in essence a measure of bandwidth, um, is computationally a bear. Um, because it actually, you have to do a maximization over a distribution and the answer is typically in the interior of the uh, simplex rather than on a vertex. That means you've got to use things like the, I always forget how to pronounce the name, the Amaratu Blatu algorithm and things like that. I'm probably <coughs> mangling it as always. Um, and it takes a long time, and that means if you wanted to do something like, for example, optimize a, a network structure subject to constraints on information capacity down the links, you're really dead in the water computationally. Here, instead, you're just having to look at the possible vertices. Um, that A should be a VT, so that's another typo. You're just doing a, um, you're just running this over all possible starting values of VT. That's only going to scale with the size of your system. So computationally, it's now trivial. So this is actually not only more reasonable as a measure of bandwidth in some scenarios from a purely information theory point of view, it can also always be calculated trivially, trivially, unlike information capacity. And this actually, in particular, might have some relevance to things like information bottleneck. I'm talking with Tali Tishvi about that. But um, anyway, that's all a little bit of an aside of the way too many things I'm trying to squish into this talk. Um, for, to go to an example, in a two-to-one map, both bounds are tight. That just gets back to um, what we were saying before, so it's the drop. So that, that tells us the uh, sign error. It's the drop in a uh, Shan entropy um, for that particular case of a two-to-one, which is log two. Okay, you could just keep playing a ton of games of this. It's like hitting a piñata. You don't have to think, and I love doing science when you don't have to think. Um, let's say that you just, in a very straightforward way, kick this up so you're talking about a kth order Markov chain, then the thermodynamic cost during a single step is bounded below by this difference in uh, conditional entropies and above by a very messy expression, which I didn't want to put down here. And um, as a particular instance, if your distribution has reached stationarity, your kth order Markov process has reached stationarity, this lower bound is actually the mutual information between um, a, a middle chunk, a, a present chunk of k successive time steps and um, the, uh, sorry, of the next future um, k time steps and the present minus the same thing for the future. So it's a matter of the changes of mutual information through time and this is actually a, um, a related formula is in the paper by uh, Susanna. Um, and uh, Crooks and so on, the PRL paper, the very nice one. So these kinds of things um, start uh, falling out. Um, so it's related to Susanna, but I don't think it's actually the exact same thing, though you might be able to derive one from the other. Um, there's lots of other stuff. You can go through and uh, look at coarse graining in the traditional statistical physics sense, and you can make examples of coarse graining that actually increase thermodynamic cost. You can make examples of coarse graining that decrease thermodynamic cost all of which can actually make, um, make sense once you actually look at what's going on. One thing that Josh and I are exploring a lot um, now is their implications for actually how to design compilers to try to minimize the amount of need for a fan. You can extend it to hidden Markov models, et cetera, et cetera. But it's also got these biological implications that I've been alluding to, and that's what I'd like to just finish up with. Um, this first part of it in particular, this is kind of, it's more related to Susanna's work in some way by like David Krakow or then by, for example, um, uh, Jeremy England. But let's say that I am a brain, a human one or actually a, a better functioning one um, or some such, and there is some process outside of me, um, some stochastic process. Part of what I've got to do in life is predict its future. Um, that's going to be something that's going on here, so that's going to be something that is generated by the states of my brain. So natural selection is going to favor brains that go through a succession of states, 
that predict the future value of ac x accurately, but at the same time, we do not want to have our brain need to generate heat. You've got to put in all that machinery that gets rid of the heat. <coughs> You've also got to um, then just worry about your brain cooking. Perhaps more important still, this puppy is taking 25% of my calorie burn. That don't come for free. I've got to find that in my environment. I've got to scavenge. I've got to kill one more woolly mammoth per month to get that extra calorie burn. Natural selection is going to be putting on a humongous pressure that I reduce the amount of thermodynamic cost that my brain is going through to generate the predictions that I'm afterwards using to figure out how I go through life and engage in my social networks and my other um, really useful things. Notice also that the actively predicting the future, what does accurately predict the future mean? It's actually not going to just be something like mutual information. There is a fitness function around there. Not all bits that I might predict are going to be equally <coughs> useful to me in terms of making sure my genome goes on to the next generation. So this is a way of actually directly coupling my predictive capabilities, the cost having to do with free energy, and my fitness function all within one set of um, equations. That's for designing brains. There are lots of things around in biology that don't at least appear to have brains involved. Instead, they just have behaviors. So let's not have some environment, the P of X, T, that I'm trying to predict. I've just got, I don't know, pick a prokaryote, some organism just by itself, operating environment. Natural selection, and so now I'm going to have my information bearing degrees of freedom be just the state of that prokaryote as it goes through life doing things. Natural selection is going to say, I want you to follow that conditional distribution, that pi, as you go from your current state to your next state, that has high fitness, however your environment defines fitness, but at the same time, do not generate heat, especially if you're getting down to that size, getting rid of that heat's going to be a pain, and do not need to go around and harvest a um, prokaryote or paramecium's version of a woolly mammoth because that's going to make life more difficult to you. <coughs> So this is saying that natural selection is going to very strongly, very strongly favor prokaryotes that behave as well as possible, quantified with a fitness function. That means their pi, the Markov, doesn't have to be Markov, but whatever, the conditional distribution that they are iterating has to actually um, maximize fitness while at the same time having a minimal thermodynamic cost. And now let's kick it up. Biospheres, Gaia, et cetera, et cetera. This is the formula I gave before for the expected thermodynamic cost with that weird thing about there not being a prior in here. This is going to vary in time. As we just say, iterate a first order Markov chain, so you feed in pi to a pi to a pi, that means that your state V, state of my computer, is going to be changing in time, so therefore the expected thermodynamic cost will be changing in time. So an obvious question is, for what kernels pi is this going to be, is the thermodynamic cost going to be monotonically increasing in time? Maybe it's going to be the Lyapunov function, or when is it going to be oscillating? What is its dynamic behavior of this expression? That's got to do with some really fun stuff in biology, because now let's say that pi is the pi of the biosphere, which is harvesting its free energy from the sun. And we can ask questions like, by popping in pi of the biosphere, assuming that we knew it, does the thermodynamic cost of the biosphere's behavior that it's implementing, does that increase with time? In that sense, is the biosphere as a whole, or any subset of it, you might want to have this hypothesis of complexity increases in time in, say, an ecosystem. This is a way of actually quantifying that in a way that you can measure it, in theory, s as soon as you actually learn at sufficient granularity what the actual um, dynamical laws of that system are. And of course, here's a fun one. We do have upper bounds of all this heat, thermodynamic cost. That heat has to be paid for in free energy flux. The biosphere as a whole is it ha cannot actually be generating more thermodynamic cost than the free energy flux from the sun. How close are we to that limit? Is the biosphere actually right up against the limit that it could not be doing any more computation? Because that would be generating thermodynamic costs. It's just not getting the flux from the sun at a high enough rate to allow it to do that. So we're maxed out. Or maybe not. Maybe there's a ton of headroom. 
That's what fossil fuels are doing. They're allowing humanity to have much more headroom in terms of how much heat we can generate, all those social networks. So, question. Every, everything can in general. Every place that there is no subscript, throw the subscript in there. Um, this is just trying to give a high-level gloss on things. There's too many symbols already. So I think this was relatively late at night, so I don't even think I have a conclusion slide, but I'm right about half an hour, and so yeah, that's it. I'll end it there. <laughs>